of supply chain incidents. And I'm not sure if uh, you're here or not, but if you have a Flipper Zero and it's trying to connect to iOS, please don't, okay? Thank you very much, and <laughs> let's, Lucas, it's yours, thank you. Thank you. Hello, everybody. So, as said, I'm Lucas. I work as um, incident manager as, at Cloudflare, and I'm here to talk a little bit about um, what changes in incident response when we're dealing with um, supply chain incidents. Um, so, the idea today is that we, we talk a little bit about, yeah, what is supply chain security in general? Um, we're gonna go into some real world examples that we have seen, um, and then, yeah, what, where the challenges, what did, you, did we learn uh, with those uh, real incidents, and yeah, how can we make things better? So, what are the main risks or the main issues with supply chains? So, I, I classified the supply chains in three pillars, the software as a service, the commercial software, and open source software. Uh, a lot of the risks are similar, but uh, there are specific the details that we need to be uh, careful when, when dealing with, with any of those um, different types of uh, supply chains. So for uh, software as a service, um, maybe the main thing is, I'm using someone else's software running their infrastructure. So what if they get compromised? What if they are attacked? That, that's a big risk that I need to take into consideration. And looking from the incident response side, how do I respond if this kind of uh, risk is, is gonna happen eventually? So uh, going further than that is what if not only they are attacked, but they, are, they can also be used as a proxy to attack my own infrastructure, my own users, um, indirectly. So when I'm using software as a service, there is usually some kind of trust in between the uh, infrastructures that, that uh, is needed, and that can be abused by attackers, and uh, the, the trust used to attack my own infrastructure. So um, also because the software is running on someone else's environment, we usually don't have full visibility. So for, from the instant response perspective, if I'm running my own software, if I have my own servers, my own cloud, I have, in general, full access to all logs. I can generate the logs, I can look at everything, I can go deep into anything I want. If that's a software as a service, I don't have this access, I only have whatever logs my provider is gonna give me. And that may be enough, that may not be enough, so this is uh, something we need to, to uh, pay attention to. Uh, and also the communication. Uh, I have a dependency on the provider, so I need communication with the provider, I need them to tell me what's, what's going on in their environment. Um, when we go to commercial software that I'm running myself, then um, again, I have trouble what if the developer or the company is, is compromised. So. I guess solar winds is probably the biggest example of that. Uh, someone, if I am a solar winds user, I, I bought the software from them, I'm using it, but they got compromised, and that eventually became a problem that I need to respond. So I, that may become an incident in my environment, and I, I am gonna, I'm the one and I need to respond to that. Um, source code leaks may lead to uh, leaking vulnerabilities, zero days, and all that kind of stuff. Um, so that, that could be a, another problem. Bad updates, so not only the updates that they're gonna make the software fail, but also if their infrastructure is, up, uh, is compromised, the updates that I'm downloading may be compromised as well. So I need to be careful with what, I, what I'm, I'm downloading. And there is a really strong level of trust that I need to have in the provider when I'm downloading updates because, yeah, uh, I'm downloading software that I'm gonna run on my infrastructure. If, if someone is able to compromise that, they're gonna compromise my, my infrastructure. Again, communication, so if something happens to their, their environment, if 
something happens to their source code, I need to know. I need to be able to, to prepare and sometimes respond. Uh, and also, zero days. It's always a problem for, uh, for instance, response. So things that come out of nowhere we don't know about and we start having to respond to them. For open source, similar, but always a, a bit different. So they can be attacked. Um, I, I can't have bad updates. Someone may compromise their GitHub account and start putting malware in there. Um, new version, um, yeah. Communication is a big issue with open source a lot of times, especially small projects that are sm a small group or one person is there, so something happens, that person doesn't have the time, they don't see it, so they, they are not able to tell me what's going on. Um, fake packages is kind of pretty common today that uh, people either generate a fake package in something that existed or a name that's similar to something that exists and then the package manager uh, confusion and then it's downloaded and yeah, we're gonna have to respond to this incident. Um, and again, zero days may happen in any kind of, uh, of software. So how exactly does it affect um, incident response, all those things? So first one is logs and visibility. So if I'm kind of outsourcing either a portion of, of an infrastructure, someone's gonna run the software for me or I'm getting the software from someone, I need to make sure I get proper logs. I need to have visibility into what's going on. That's the only way. So logs are the big tool of an incident responder. If we don't have logs, there's nothing we can do. And so we need to make sure we have them. Um, we also need to have good logs. They need to be complete. So this is more of an issue in uh, software as a service environments that sometimes the provider does not give us full visibility into the logs. We have partial things. Uh, we don't usually have logs in the inf of the infrastructure, so we only have at, at the software layer. So all, all those things may affect the way we're gonna be uh, responding. The and, and thing that's common to every kind of log, I need to understand them. So. Your incident response team needs to be able to go to the log and really understand what's going on, understand what those events are and what do they mean in real life. So uh, a lot of logs are a bit cryptic. They're, they have kind of keywords that are not extremely clear. Uh, they can be short. And so all this means that uh, in, in terms of preparation for an incident response team, I need to be able to understand what is in the logs. When I start looking for something in the logs. I need to understand and know how it looks like. Otherwise, I'm never gonna find it. Uh, and cost, that's mostly in the, the software as a service side because providers usually charge more if you want more logs. But also, if you are running on your own infrastructure, you need to store those logs. So that, there is a cost that's uh, associated in, in that. Um, time to respond, so any provider will need to tell, or should tell us when something wrong is going on. So be it a SaaS provider, it's even more important, but uh, commercial software, uh, I guess, yeah, again, SolarWinds is the big example. People need to know what's going on. People need to uh, be able to prepare to, uh, to roll back, apply patches, or take things out of the internet. So all, all this is, is crucial. So, uh, uh, a timely response will, will need a timely communication. So how long they, it takes to fix the, the things, and um, yeah, uh, all, all this is, is part of what I need to be able to respond. Um, again, communication, so not only uh, do things quickly, but they also communicate clearly. Tell me what's going on. Uh, it, uh, at some point that I'm trusting a company, I want them to tell me. If they hide stuff, it's gonna be worse. It's gonna be the worst scenario that I can. Uh, and the worst scenario we face in incident response is when the provider hides things. Because then we're, we're fighting not only the, the attackers, we're also fighting the lack of information because the company is not providing it to us. So, um, and collaboration with the, the companies and open source projects so that we can get fixes out. So that we, we understand how to fix 
so that, that uh, they help us in the investigation. They help us find what's wrong. They help us find what's going on. And, and then we eventually uh, can quickly fix it. So given that, um, I want to talk here about a couple of uh, examples that we had uh, in real life about incidents that, that we saw and we had to respond. Incidents related to those different kinds of uh, supply chains, uh, dependencies that we have from, from a vendor. So um, the first one from uh, 2022 is an Okta compromise. So it's not the one from this year, it's the one from last year. The one from this year didn't have time to uh, include in the proposal nor uh, in, in the presentation itself. So uh, yeah, last year we got this. So this is what, um, for me it was the middle of the night. So uh, it was waking up in the middle of the night and getting this information. For the, my colleagues in the US, I think it was the end of the afternoon, begin, uh, kinda dinner time, some, something like that. But basically, uh, in January 2022, Okta was compromised, and they basically didn't say anything until the group that compromises, compromised them, which is called Lapsus, started uh, publishing uh, screenshots of Okta's internal tools saying that, yeah, here's the proof that uh, we, we managed to compromise them. Uh, from my perspective, the big issue was, if you look at one of the screenshots, you see Cloudflare's logo in there, which means, yeah, well, someone that took this screenshot was looking into my configuration inside of my software as a service provider. And on top of that, uh, it's redacted somewhere in the, the bottom here, it's not really uh, legible, but there was a, um, the email from one of our users. And obviously it was a valid email for a valid user that was uh, doing there. So that's what the user we came to call user zero, that's where all our investigation started. So basically it started with us getting a big surprise. There was no communication whatsoever. And eventually someone publishes these uh, screenshots and says, hey, you have been compromised. And for us, it was a sign that we had to uh, quickly check what was going on. So yeah, as I said, they claimed that they had compromised Okta. Um, so without any communication from Okta yet, we, we started getting through the logs. So we have logs from the, the uh, software as a service console. We download logs, we store them in our own systems and so on, so we started going through the logs. Um, but first, we found out that the logs didn't seem to be complete. So there, there were a few events that we could not find in the logs that should be there. Uh, and yeah, in conversations with the provider, we were able to find out that uh, what we could see in the console was not exactly everything. So we were, uh, the, the provider did a filter on the logs that were given to customers. That was the, the, the explanation we got. So eventually we managed to get the extra information, see everything, that uh, all the events that we expected to see there. Um, but there were also a lot of event names that were not clear. We didn't clearly understand that. So during the response and the house is on fire, and then we need to stop, go to the documentation, go to the support and, and start asking, okay, what's this? I see this keyword here and I don't understand what this is. So that's another thing that happened in the middle of, of this whole uh, exercise. Um, so yeah, Okta is an ID provider, provides credentials, stores our, our passwords and yeah, uh, multi-factor authentication. So yeah, what do you do when you have a problem with that? You rotate credentials, you uh, clear the sessions, make sure that everybody needs to uh, input a new password. And obviously we started with the, the users that were more directly affected with, uh, from that uh, incident. Um, from all the analysis of the logs and we've eventually we got the help from the, the provider, there was no event showing that the attacker had done anything to that 
uh, configuration that he, uh, they, they were able to see. And, and the user in question was also not affected by, uh, by this attack. So at the end, it was good that we were not uh, indirectly attacked, but it was very close. So yeah, and maybe another day I can tell you the story about the, this year's Okta compromise and this one, yeah, we were affected. It was an indirect attack that, that uh, directly affected us. Um, but yeah, maybe a story for another day. Um, moving on, uh, that's an interesting uh, bug, and this one is on, on the pillar of the open source things. So there is a very strange construct for IPv6 addresses, is that you can map an IPv4 address inside an IPv6 one. So that's RFC compliant and it exists. And yeah, I also didn't know about that when we started investigating this thing. So basically, this is the format you do. You basically put a bunch of zeros, a, a bunch of ones, and then you just put the bytes from the IPv4 and it, yeah, it's there. It's uh, the, the way to map. It's supposed to be a valid IP, uh, IPv6 address and it should work. So fine. So what did the, this researcher do? So this was something that came to us through a uh, bug bounty. So the researcher did a demo and put this. So they, they uh, basically created this DNS record. Uh, that's an IPv6 DNS record, uh, the, the four A's. And it's basically mapping the loopback back address. So loopback address for, if anyone doesn't know, that's an address that uh, allows me to send packets to myself, basically. So it's uh, uh, a way for, for us, um, any machine to talk back to, uh, to itself. So in IPv4, that's the uh, 127.0.0.1, it's pretty well known. But if you map it into an IPv6, this is what you get. So we have a lot of systems that are written in, in Go, Golang. Uh, and one of the, the portions of Golang is the net library, and that library does all kind of uh, network uh, stuff. And one of the things it does is it reads DNS records and it um, uh, gives us the results of the DNS records that, that it's reading. So our software was basically calling that library, that's an open source thing, and asking for what is the IP of exploit.example.com. And the structure that was being returned is this that is on the bottom of the, the slide here. But that's basically something saying, oh, this is an IPv6 but the string that we see is absolutely not an IPv6, this is an IPv4. So with this, the attacker was able to use another problem that we had in the software because we use um, block lists to prevent sys uh, those kind of IPs to be used, especially loopback IPs to be used, trying to connect back to ourselves. So, uh, we don't allow any um, external code to connect back to the, the, our own, uh, the same server. But, so that's, that's uh, the, the idea of the block list. But when we started searching for that, so um, because the structure was saying this is an IPv6, we would look for that 127.0.0.1 in a list of IPv6 addresses and it wasn't there because it's not an IPv6 address. That's not a look back address for IPv6. So it was never found and the attacker then chaining those two things was able to make connections or start connections to, to ser services running in the same server. So if that service running on, on the server had no authentication, was not checking anything, then they would have access to whatever they wanted which is a reality for a lot of services that uh, when, when they are bound to the loopback, usually a lot of times they don't have any authentication. They just say, okay, it's myself, that's good. Let's just go for it. So yeah, that's another mistake. So uh, what happened is, well, the guy was able to connect and he was able to demonstrate that he was 
doing uh, connections, and he could iterate over the ports and, and try. And eventually, he started using uh, internal IPs like the, the IPv4 10 network that's usually used, used for internal only communications and trying to establish connections to other servers. So yeah, um, it was pretty bad. So how do we address something like that? Well, it's an open source library. We can go into the library. So we debugged it and we found the thing. We found the, the open source code. We look at the open source code and we find out, yes, that's how it's working. So in this case, it was considered critical enough that we didn't wait for any patches or anything from the open source project. We started work, doing our own workarounds to fix this because, yeah, we didn't want to wait. And it was then the, the developers were communicating with the project and so on so that they could go through the process of, of uh, getting, getting a fix. But, um, yeah, so this is how a bug in an open source library in a very unknown feature of IPv4 and IPv6. And yeah, we got hit by it and it was, uh, it, it was potentially very bad. So the, the good thing is because our system was, that was using this library had good logs, we could find that no one else except that researcher try to do this kind of trick. So it's so obscure that uh, he was actually the first to have this idea. So yeah, in another case, that's be becoming a bit old, but I think it's uh, uh, a very important example. So that's uh, Log4Shell, the famous bog for uh, Log4J. So anyone here didn't hear about Log4Shell? No? Good. So I'm gonna go, so basically Log4Shell allowed you to send a small string into something and if into a system written in Java, if that system used Log4J and that string would hit the Log4J library, it could allow remote code execution. So yeah, it was pretty bad. It was one of the few CVs that got a full 10 in terms of uh, CVSS. So everybody was freaking out about this um, and we looked at it in the beginning and we just thought, yeah, we don't use Java. There is no system done at Cloudflare that, that is developed in Java. Oh, we use everything. We have Python, we have Go, we have whatever you can think of, but no Java. So yeah, we're safe, right? So yeah, eventually we started looking a bit more and no, we were not. So we had a, a ton of third party software that the provider used Java and the provider used Log4J, we were using. They were running in our infrastructure, in our servers. They had access to a lot of stuff. So yeah, um, we had then to start understanding what is the risk that we're facing. And this is one of the most strange incident response experience you may have is when instead of looking into logs, you're trying to build an inventory of systems. That's not what incident responders usually do. Uh, that's not what incident responders usually are trained to do, but yeah, that's what need to, needed to happen in this case. So go through all the inventories, find out all the vendors we are using, find, and it can be commercial software, it can be open source software, whatever it is that we're running that we didn't develop, we need to find out if there is any portion of that code that's developed in Java, and then after that, well, let's find out if they use log4j in any portion of that whole thing. So it was, it was a huge search, a lot of people, uh, uh, multiple teams getting involved, and it required a lot of communication. So we had to reach out to a lot of providers. So some are obvious. So um, if you have Atlassian tools that run in-house, they are Java-based, and this is known. This is not no secret. So yeah, okay, we have it, let's go. So this is a, an easy one, but there are other systems that we had no idea which language they were used, uh, they, uh, they were written on. So it's, it's very hard, we, and you have to, 
find someone in the company, someone that's able to answer this, that question, and someone that's willing to answer the question. So it takes sometimes a lot of negotiation to find, find out exactly all the systems that you have that have some piece of a small library that they are using. So this was the, the um, communication piece that we had to go through and, and go together with a, a lot of other teams to find all those, those uh, pieces of software that could be affected by Log4j so that we could fix it. And on top of that, fixing it is not trivial. So you need to do a, 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 a fix for each system and it may be different. So file names may be different, the version of Log4j may be different, everything, you, so each system you look at may have a different workaround that's needed. So that also complicates the, the, or the whole response on, on how do we respond uh, to this kind of incident, very widespread. So uh, I would say that probably more than 90% of Java software uses Log4j, or at least at the time it was uh, something like that. Um, and on top of that, we had the investigation. So for each one of those systems, we had to go through the logs to f understand if has someone exploited this and run something on my server. So, and, and that's different for every single system. The logs are different, so the, the way they, they um, put the events or the name the, of the events are sometimes different, so it's, it's uh, very time consuming. And the more systems you have that are affected, the more work you're gonna have for each one of them. Um, so, yeah, in terms of takeaways, yeah, we need inventory, so that's, that's true. But, but the traditional inventory that most companies have does not list what underlying language is, uh, was used for that system. So most of the in inventory systems that we have uh, in, in most companies would say, oh, I have Atlassian, let's say uh, Confluence. I use Confluence, but they will not go to the details, say, okay, we have Confluence and it uses Java, it has whatever version of Java, it has all the information I need to know to understand if it's vulnerable by uh, Log4j. Uh, Log4Shell, Log4j is a different story. So this requires a different kind of inventory f for us to be able to respond. And we need to start adding more information so that we are able to, uh, to understand what to do uh, when it happens. Yeah, the other takeaway, yeah, we need communication channels with our providers. So when this happens and I need to understand um, which software may have been affected, uh, most of the time I'm gonna have to ask the, the company so that the company can provide me an answer. So this is another uh, very important point. Yeah, and open source intelligence. So when Log4Shell wa was the top trending whatever on Hacker News or Twitter, we could see a lot of comments and, and posts saying, oh yeah, uh, software X is affected, software Y is affected. So this is also input for you so that you can you, you need to check those things, obviously, but uh, yeah, that's, that's, a, that's a start to know things that may, uh, may have been affected. So those are the uh, three incidents with three different kinds of things that uh, we had that forced us to do instant response in things that were basically supply chain. It's something done by someone else. It wasn't our software, it was someone else's software that we used some, in some uh, way that was creating the, the problem. So what did we learn about it? A lot of the things are, yeah, we already mentioned and it's easy to, uh, to grasp. So yeah, for software as a service, have a good communication channel. So if you're using software as a service, Make sure you, you can talk to their security team when you need. Because that, that's a, something that happened to us multiple times, is that you go to support, you get first level support, and then you go to second level support, and then the guy decides, oh yeah, this is a security issue, and he, he inputs something. That's the first, after a while, in, in our last 
after the incident, it took us four hours to be able to start talking to um, someone in the security team. So we need better channels for response to incidents, especially incidents um, are getting faster and faster, so we need faster response. Um, yeah, uh, get logs and put them offline. So if you have using software as a service, if your provider is, at, is attacked somehow and that affects you, and you can't access the portal, and you can't access the logs, you, there is no investigation possible. So if you don't have the logs on your own server, on your own storage, then you, you won't be able to do anything or investigate anything. That's, that's uh, simply what's gonna happen. Reduce trust, yeah, that's always a good uh, security practice, security architecture. Uh, and yeah, monitor for indirect attacks. So that's part of the reducing trust, that you need to monitor for certain actions if they happen. Yeah, don't be aware of certain actions. If they happen, they could be an attack on, on trying to proxy through the, the provider. And yeah, be aware of, uh, of that and more, have good detections in your SIEM for, for this kind of, uh, of case. Uh, yeah, commercial software, yeah, communications is key. Um, make sure you understand the logs. That's something we suffer a lot of times that, yeah, we got, we, get, we have logs, yes, but what are those events? What does it mean? We don't know. We have to go study and we, we lose a lot of time. Uh, always reduce trust again and monitor for suspicious activity. Yeah, you're running it in-house, you should monitor it. That doesn't really matter. Um, with open source, comms are more complicated. They have uh, certain channels they use depending on the project. Uh, sometimes they, they use GitHub, they may use Twitter, whatever it is. So understand how you're gonna get the, the proper communication. Collaborate with them, uh, create trust as much as you can with the, the developers, that's gonna help. Um, again, logs, have the logs, but also understand them. Reduce trust always and monitor. So those are things that need to happen for all those um, categories. So um, how can we be better prepared for security response or incident response in, in this kind of environment, in a supply chain uh, eventuality? So yeah, uh, we talked about logs. Uh, we talked about communication channels, we talked about inventory, so we need to know what's, what's in there, what we have, and what's inside, what we are using. Um, monitoring, for sure. Um, more, uh, be aware of indirect attacks, that's uh, a big one. And finally, contracts. So if you are in a commercial relationship with a provider, make sure your contracts say that they need to answer to your security questions. Make sure the contract says that they need to inform you when they have a security issue. Because that's the only thing you're gonna be able to, to do in terms of forcing them to change the way they approach this, uh, this relationship. So if it's in the contract, well, if it doesn't happen, at least you have a contract you can try to enforce. Um, so, yeah. Uh, Anyone that wants more information about the three examples I put here, uh, we have blogs about each one of them. So that, that's the details that uh, we, more, more, much more details than what I share here today uh, on how those uh, uh, incidents happen and how we did to uh, respond to them. Um, and yes, thank you everybody. And you have my uh, social media handles here if you wanna get in touch. Thank you, Lucas. Any questions? We have a few minutes for questions. Over there, a speaker will be with you in a minute. Hello. <coughs> Great talk, Lucas. Um, so what I would like to, it's more of a statement than a question, is that, as you said, inventory of knowing what technologies are being used is very, very important. And many of us here that work in security have seen the, let's say, rise of S-bombs, software bill of materials. So um, 
how do, what difficulties do you see in like it seems like a no brainer oh everybody should have an S bomb but do you, what what do you see in terms of difficulties in implementing this thoroughly so that you have like full inventories of every single piece that's used okay uh, that's going to be about a previous life that I used to do vulnerability management but but yeah um, it's it seems trivial to generate S bombs for one project. When you have a few thousands of them, then uh, at scale the problem may be may be harder. Uh, so a few things that I've seen in terms of generating S bombs is is a bit when you have too many projects. Well, volume uh, and what do you do with them after you you generate them? Uh, the second issue is uh, support. We had a lot of. Um, tech stacks that were not fully supported by, by the providers we were using. So uh, you end up with either ignoring some of your projects because they don't fit what the provider can do, or you end up with a patchwork of providers, and then you have all the problems that come with that, that you need to start adjusting the outputs and uh, things don't really match. So um, yeah, SBOMs are, are a nice idea, a nice solution. But as with any technology at scale, it becomes more complicated. So uh, the, the second thing about S-bombs, now a little bit more into incident response, is that especially commercial providers, they don't give you anything. So uh, in some of those cases, it's a lot for J, for example, it's extremely hard to get those companies to tell you if they are using Java and if they're, if they're using Log4J in their software. They, they, they just don't tell you. So if they, and, and that's the minimum information, that's not even a full S-bomb. So they, they don't wanna provide this information. That's, that's one of the, the realities. Um, on top of that, when you get software as a service, they even have another excuse not to provide it. Because they said, you're not gonna run the software, you don't need to know, we're gonna take care of it. And, and uh, if you have a, a SaaS provider that is, is affected by uh, Log4Shell, well, yeah, it's gonna affect you as well. So, but you don't know, and you're never gonna get an S-bomb to be able to find it out. So, yeah, uh, it, the, the, the problem is how we use a good tool in, in a way that, that makes sense in the market and uh, that is accepted by, by the market. So, yeah, th those are the, the, the things uh, in terms of, of S-bombs. We, we, ni nice if we had them, but I don't think we are there. I, don't, I think it's very difficult to get them. We we'll have a, a few ways to go until it's <laughs> widespread. Thank you. Yeah. Anyone else? Uh, here in the Over front. There. The other the front is there. a question. Thank you, uh, great presentation. Um, I would like to, to ask you in the second use case you showed um, where you, you had to kind of develop your own, um, your own solution, your own fix before the Golang developers. What kind of things can you do since you probably, when you build your software and everything, you are going to to collect the, um, the leaves and everything from the, the official repositories, what kind of things can you do um, in a situation like that? Well, it, it will depend on the, on the library you're using. So in that case, it was a network thing about uh, reading IP addresses and understanding how to parse IP addresses. So you can handle this by either not using that for parsing, or one thing, uh, the, the first thing we did is that we, instead of having uh, separated searches for IPv6 and IPv4, we just made one big list and we searched everything. That, that kind of solved this issue, but it doesn't solve any, every issue you can have on a, on a library. And uh, as with software, it, it's gonna depend on the case. So there may be other bugs that will affect you that um, will require another kind of, of uh, solution. So I've, I've seen libraries, for example, that have um, a regular expression denial of service. If you give them a certain regular expression, 
they just run forever, they never finish, and your software is gonna be there and eventually crash. So the solution for that is completely different than a solution for something related to networks. So uh, the, the, the thing about software is that it can do almost everything, but also it's, it's complex. So there, uh, I, don't, I don't see and I don't know any one solution that you can use in, in every case. It's, it's each case you're gonna have to do. The one thing you can do in terms of responding when it happens is have good logs. Make sure your software outside of the library is logging what you're doing. And then, yes, you're gonna have information to debug and understand what the problem is. That's, that's what helped us in this case. So we had logs saying, okay, I saw this and then the result was this. So it, it was trivial for the developers to understand that whatever they were getting from a library was strange. I'm not gonna say it's completely wrong, but it was strange. It was not what they expected in this case. So then they were able to find where the problem was. And, and that is probably true. Having good logs or making sure your, your own portion of the code have, uh, provides good logs is gonna help you a lot. Thank you very much. Anyone else? Okay. Thank you, Lucas. Okay, thank you.